Copy on hey, a Tuesday lover. and block. Wait, wait who, are who are you? you? I'm, I'm your winner. I know, I know who you are. But what are you doing, doing in my video? video? Your, your video? video? Yes, my video. This, this is clearly the space, space where I do videos, videos every, every week, and you're infringing upon it. If you don't remove yourself at once, I will be forced to call YouTube security. Don't think I won't. They have me on hold. Me too. I don't want to wait for our lives to be over. Here's a phenomenon you might be familiar with. To demonstrate, I'm going to enlist the help of Craig Benzine, otherwise known as... Here's Craig sitting at his desk editing one of his videos. It's late, he's getting tired, and he thinks another cup of coffee is in order. So he, he goes into the kitchen, pours himself a cup, and realizes that he has to, to go into the time machine room because he needs to get the... Wait a second. What did he need? He can't seem to remember. The first impulse is to go back to the kitchen, stand by the coffee machine, and oh, oh yes, 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 now he remembers he needed the... I'm sure you've all had this experience before, the experience of arriving somewhere, only to realize that you've forgotten what you went there to do. Why does this happen? Well, last year, neurological researchers from Notre Dame published an article called Why Walking Through Doorways Causes Forget. It's a, it's a good title. And their thesis is that at all times, our brains are operating within something called an event model, a collection of memories relevant to the current activity. Walking through a doorway can unintentionally purge this model because whatever was happening in the old room is less likely to be relevant now that you've changed venues. Why do our brains do this to us? Well, because normally event models operate beautifully. It would be impossible to keep all of our memories at the fore of our mind, so our brains employ this incredible mechanism to keep all the relevant memories within reach. An event model is being built in your brain right now. Whoa. <laughs> yes, but I'd, I'd like to make a larger point here if I may. You may. Thanks. See, this whole business with event models gives us a great, universally recognizable example of the fact that our brains are busy every moment with activities of which we're not aware. In fact, before we are aware of any one thing that we do, there are a series of neurological activities preceding it. Benjamin Libet, a pioneering scientist in the field of human consciousness, famously proved that activity in the brain can be measured some 300 milliseconds before the person feels that he has decided to move. Today, with the use of MRI, that estimate has been extended to something like six seconds. How should this be extrapolated in regard to a concept we all know as free will? Free will is at the basis of nearly all our belief systems. It founds not only moral considerations, but legal ones. The concepts of incarceration and retribution are bound up with responsibility, which is bound up with free choice. But as we've seen, our choices proceed from neural activity of which we are again not aware. So does, does this mean, for example, that a murderer can plead the defense, my brain made me do it? Einstein didn't believe in free will, yet he still believed that murderers should be put in jail. Why? Well, because they're dangerous. The fact that neural activity proceeds and determines our choices doesn't mean that the murderer can separate the part of himself which is responsible for the act of murder. We are choosing all the time. We can't help it. Even with the knowledge that we can't choose what we choose, we can't stop choosing. You can sit there and do nothing, but doing nothing is itself a choice and one that gets harder with every second. Eventually you'll decide that this business of doing nothing is a waste of your time and you'll choose to get up. So maybe we should imagine our consciousness as something like a river. Choice exists as a part of that river, but some ways downstream from the source. And farther downstream from the choice is the action, and the action has real consequences in the world around you, and those consequences, to the extent that you're around to witness them, have an effect on the river as a whole. See, the, the mysterious source of the river, for the most part, is not acting against you. It's not an external consciousness, and it's not a random decision generator. It acts in harmony with your beliefs and ideals, with what makes you happy and sad. And it's informed by the consequences of your choices and by the choices of those around you and by the environment in which you live and grow. There is an experiential disconnect here which is hard to overcome. When you look back over your day, your month, your life, you feel as if you were the author of your choices. You feel as if you chose this road as opposed to that road and that over time, this free decider, which you call I, has built its own identity. The problem is, that this is impossible to reconcile with the fact that at every moment of your life, you're being informed by unconscious processes like, say, event models. Free will is an illusion. It's difficult to accept. It's difficult for me to accept that my consciousness is telling me a story about myself which 
isn't true, but I can know it despite my feelings and I can remind myself of it when I take myself too seriously or I'm too hard on myself for mistakes. And maybe in endeavoring to understand this part of me, I can become more empathetic toward those who, like me, like all of us, try so desperately hard to control their lives and trip up in the most spectacular ways. Yes! Jesus! I remember what I was supposed to do! What? I have to save the world from this nuclear explosion by setting the time machine to- Great! No! no!